Cool. All right. Well, all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, glad, glad to see you can all make it. Um, so, so yeah, um, I'm today I'm going to be talking about, uh, well, the talk is here. Let me show you my slide deck right here. Um, probably a quick introduction. So I, I actually work at uh, AOL, um, which was recently was acquired by Verizon. So I actually started uh, at Verizon. So, you know, if you, you probably know some, some number of folks in the Skull community who have, who uh, also work there as well. And I've had the, had the privilege of work with a lot of those people. So um, I actually, uh, under the AOL team, I'm actually working on the Go90 uh, project, which is a, uh, a, a mobile video product that uh, for, for, stre for streaming uh, videos, but bo both live and pre-recorded shows. So, so and, and on, on our team, we actually use Scala exclusively. And so I've had, had the opportunity to work on a lot of uh, really interesting challenges um, with scale, scale, uh, writing uh, various uh, backend services that, that operate at, at scale. So, um, but today's focus is actually going to be more on the FP side of things. And let me uh, let me show my slide deck right here. So let's see, is that looking clear for everyone? <clears throat> is that looking good, everyone? So I'll be sure that this is looking okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So um, I have to for forgive me. This is my first time doing the remote talk. So. Um, uh, so yes, want to be sure everything's looking okay. So right here, uh, so we're going to be talking today about uh, a number of a, a number of useful useful uh, concepts there for um, for you know, functional programming. And we are actually going to be discussing. We'll be showing code examples in that in both Scala Z and Cats. Um, so, so you can see sort of side by side there, but really we're going to be talking about concepts where we'll be we'll be standing on the so, the shoulders of giants, and I I talk about this with the same spirit of uh, you know as as Sir Isaac Newton, um, he actually didn't come up with the phrase by the way as you can see the footnote there, but um, but he's 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 often this this uh, this quote is actually often attributed to him. So, but it's the same sort of idea where there's a lot of very, very interesting uh, concepts in, in category theory that we, we see leverage now increasingly in, uh, in at the uh, FP pro uh, programming paradigm. And we're going to be show, we're going to be looking at, at a lot of these concepts as how, how they could be, be leveraged into actually solving, uh, solving real world problems. So once again, this is about realizing the full the full power of functional programming. And when when we when someone asks you says, okay, what what is FP all about? First instinct might be to talk about uh, basically run down this list that we have here. We talk about functions. We can pass them around, pass functions to uh, to other functions, uh, assign them to values. And have functions that actually return functions, um, <clears throat> being able to define functions in line, and this notion of uh, where you try to write code such that you have as little as mutation as possible, being able to compose different pieces of functionality together, and sort of uh, favoring recursion over iteration for solving problems, and referential transparency, which by the way, uh, referential transparency is that's actually a very core uh, tenant of FP, where you're saying that all all uh, all, all code code that is referentially transparent, if given a certain a, any value input, you will receive you'll you'll get the same output, and there'll be no side effects. So, for example. 
uh, if you were to take like the system current time in milliseconds, that actually is not referentially transparent because each time you call it, you'll get, if you're not passing anything in, but each time you call it, it's going to give you a different time. So you want to try to, when you're writing, when you're trying to follow FP, you're trying to uh, try to write as much of your code to be as pure as possible. Um, and we'll get in more into that. Uh, now, types, it's, it's arguable whether types is really need, needed with FP. I would argue that it, that it is needed because it, as it really, it provides you rails upon which at, you know, actually, as you're building your components, you could actually have the compiler do more work for you. And of course, Scala is all about strong typing. And of course, you could do FP in the type system as well. But once again, this is strict, strictly speaking, all this list right here is essentially all we really need to be really get realizing the full power of FP. Well, we've seen that type of thinking before. I mean, yeah, all you really need is a, an instruction set at the CPU level to write code, to write programs, to do what you need. But obviously, you know, we, you know, assembly language is only used in very specific cases these days. And that's even small. There's less cases now than there were, you know, you know, in the past. So, so just as structured programming, uh, structured imperative programming gives us with if else statements and while loops and, you know, these notion procedures and variables, where are the constructs for FP? Right? Well, we have a few already, and uh, a, a few well-known ones. These are probably the most well-known right, it's right here, functors and monads. And a, a, just sort of a quick refresher for those who, who, who may not know off the top of their head what, what, you know, what functor and monad is. A functor is, is simply an operation that supports the map operation. So you go from, you have some type F of a type A, you do a map and it'll be f of b. Now I'm not listing all the laws here. You have to have some laws where, like it, it that that relate to identity and and if you were to compose these together, they behave as you expect. Um, or there's 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 some laws here that you uh, that that also apply. But uh, but you know, with the, when the scope of this talk, this is what a functor is. It supports a map operation. Monads support a point and a bind operation. Now, I, the point, pure unit, they all mean the same thing. You'll see different different places. Bind and flat map mean the same thing. So a monad supports the ability to go A to M of A, meaning you take a type and you lift it into a monad type of A. Okay? So you can think of like an option, for example. So you say you take you take you say a sum of, of an A. And then suddenly you have an option, option of A, which is the value sum A. And, or like even a sequence, for example, that would also be a monad with a point operation. And then you have the flat map operation, which says, okay, you have an M of A. And we have a function that will take, take an A and give you an M of B. And given those two, you can actually get an M of B. So it has the effect of applying an operation internally to, to to a value within within a monad and actually doing the map so so this is this is what the so this would be the flat map operation and we as you'll see in examples we'll see we're actually making making a use of this but you know these are these monads functors that you've you probably uh worked with these uh on a number of places these are these are probably the you know, two, two, two more basic concepts in, in well, in category three, but ma major components for FP. Now we also have monoids and semigroups, and uh, a monoid is really it's it's the you have a function that takes in two m's and will give you an m as a result, and there's a zero, so you're pending, and you have a zero, which is your base case. That's that's what a monoid is. Now, semigroup is the same thing, except you don't have a zero. So you can think of it as like similar to like a stream where you have you know, new values being computed as you're as you're pending them together, but no real no real base case. 
Um, so, and, and that'll actually, sem we'll, we'll be, look, uh, semi-group will be coming up later on in, in this talk. Now, once again, all these, all these principles, there are some laws. Um, I, I, I actually encourage it to look them up there. They're actually very, they're very, um, they're pretty straightforward, actually. It's a little bit outside the scope of this talk, but each of these do have laws associated with them. Now, you see that these different concepts you use, it's it's tempting to think that okay these are these are sort of vague abstractions that you know might have they're, they're kind of interesting but sort of you know not really that applicable but it's important to understand and and Dijkstra says this perf uh, says this better better than I would that that abstracting is when when you're trying to abstract your your it's not about being vague at all it's about defining a new level of a, a new way of thinking so that you can actually precisely define what you're talking about. And this is what FP is all about. It's about digging deeper into, okay, how do I define my problems? How do I define the pieces of the code that I'm working on, or the different components I'm building? And FP forces you to be very precise about it. It forces you to really understand, you know, what it is you're doing. And it's, it's it's really quite amazing the the benefits of that. So now we're going to look at notion of some types, okay? And some types. In order to understand what a some type is, is we have to wait. Actually, let's skip a slide. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um. So we're gonna look at notion of some types. So now we. Before we look at sometimes, let's look at the, the Scala either. Now, I imagine you look, you've seen this before. Most folks at that when they start start Scala, they 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 look at the 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 Scala dot either is a very common one to look at first for saying okay, we'll represent like either a left value or right value, or sorry, left type or right type. So we say like okay, we have a list of integers, and we want to return an either string or double. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a case match and say, okay, if it's empty, we're going to say, oh, no values provided. So that's essentially your error message. <clears throat> Otherwise, if there are elements in there, we just kind of do a match, uh, you know, like this and say, okay, well, then we're going to compute the mean. So that's what the mean operation needs to do. Well, what if we want to take two mean values and add them together? What to do, right? I mean, you have two values, you're computing the averages, you want to add these averages together. Maybe you want to compute another average or something. Uh, this is interesting because, well, this is neither type and it's possible it could be a left or right. Uh, it could be either a string or a double. So in order to do that, you actually have to handle all the cases. You have to say, okay, what if both are errors? What if one's an error? What if they're both the values and you could finally add them together? Well, you have to list all these cases out. So we stand back for a second and say, okay, what did either what did either provide for us? The answer is not really a whole lot. All it did is it it, it defined it gave us the ability to define a value that's either one type or another. But once you have two of these, you need to combine them together. Suddenly that abstraction. That's, that's that's supposed to abstract away the fact that you have two possible types. It breaks down, and you have to list them all out, all out, all the combinations. So, to be really honest, Scala dot either is a rather weak abstraction. And of course, I I throw this in there. I say that well, let's not even get the exceptions because exceptions you get an exception that's thrown and it blows out the stack, and yeah, you know, we all know about that. And I bring that up here because generally when you're thinking in terms of I have a computation that might succeed or failure, succeed or fail, it's very often people will look between either using Scala.either or use exceptions. So what we need is a true sum type. That is essentially what we need. We need an abstraction, which is actually the, the official name for this is a sum type. Now what do I mean by some type? Well, let's say we have a product, okay? They're related. You have like a case class called fruit, which has a name and a color. 
Well, so it, I say this is a product because if you look at it, see, you'll notice that case classes all extend product. So they're all type product as well. Now let's say that we have some possible values, apple, mango, and colors green and red, right? We could have many more than that, but let's say these are our possibilities. Well, this is referred to as a product because your, your space of possible values of fruit is a product of each of the field. It's a Cartesian. Uh, it's a Cartesian, a product of, of each of the different fields together. That's why it's referred to as a product. So what we mean by sum is we mean that, well, it's, it's either this value or that value. Okay, so product is a conjunction and it, it, things added together like a case class. A sum is it's either this or that. Now, the term coproduct actually means the same thing as sum. So if you've seen, you hear people talk about coproducts, you know, it's, it means the same thing as sum, okay, because it's the dual of a product, okay? So just a little terminology clarification there. Well, Scholar e, Scala dot either is a poor sum type because composing them, once again, you have to list all the cases. Well, both cats and Scalzi support what is known as a disjunction. And disjunctions support the same ability to represent both type. Uh, it's, it's a sum type. Um, but since it's a proper sum type, they compose a lot, a lot more elegantly. So let's look at we're going to show you an example here in Scala Z and one in cats. So in the Scala Z example, you see this interesting backslash forward slash. Well, that's similar to the mathematical uh, disjunction symbol saying this or that. So, you know, a little cryptic at first, but when you start using this, you, uh, I, I find myself that it's, uh, you know, you, it, it cut, you get, you get used to, uh, you get used to the symbol there. And, so if we're computing a mean, notice that it's very similar to when I use a Scala either. Very, it, the, a few differences is obviously your type is a string, disjunction double. And then you have right there where you say, oh, the minus is on the left side, which is saying, okay, this is a left side value, the string. Okay, no values provided. It's a minus on the right side in the second case. We say, okay, it's a double. And I'm computing it right there. So very similar to Scala either. In fact, if you're looking at the Scala Z code base, which I definitely encourage doing, by the way, it's actually quite interesting. Um, surprisingly readable, actually. Um, get, you know, just given the complexity of what what this library provides, um, you you'll notice that they they refer to it as an either actually. Now, cats uh, cats is an alternative to Scala Z. A lot of great Great functionality there. Um, sort of an aim to be a bit more user friendly. So you'll notice instead of using the symbol disjunction, it says XOR. So it's you know it's exclusive or saying it's either one or the other. So but they're the same thing. XOR dot left, XOR dot right. Um, map onto the minus back forward and back forward minus uh, symbols respectively. So those are those are that's how it looks in cats versus scalzi very similar. Now, once we've done this, we define our mean using disjunctions. Let's say we want to compute two mean values. So we have x equals mean of the you know the these of of the of one list of values, and then y mean of another list of values. Well, now we could do a four comprehension where we combine the two together. We say, okay, a is x, b is y. We say yield a plus b. Now. <coughs> This is pretty awesome because that right there actually returns, that actually returns a disjunction, that whole thing, that for comprehension. It returns a disjunction of string or the value. And I can go back, so we see string or, or double, okay? That is the return type of this for comprehension right there. Now, <clears throat> it, it might look magical at first, but if you look deeper into how well, what does a four comprehension mean in Scala? It's all consistent. Uh, here we have an example, the, the examples in cats. If I were to take that four comprehension, replace it with a series of flat maps, that's how it would look. 
x dot flat map, x v y dot flat map, y v x or dot right, and x v plus y v. Now, <clears throat> it's important to understand that the disjunctions are what is known as right biased. And I say they're right biased because it's generally the left side is used to represent an error value, or error condition. And the right side is used to represent the actual value of a computed result. Now, this, this actually, this is by design uh, due, due to the fact that a disjunction is actually a right biased monad. And that's why these flat map operations work, and that's why you can build a nice, clean for comprehension to do these computations. But look at what we've done here. We, we're no longer listing all the cases and saying, well, what if this, what if the, what if X is an error uh, and Y is an error? What if X is a value and Y is a value? What if, you, don't, you have to list all four of those cases. Here you just simply, you combine them together because all these follow the rules of being, of being a monad and uh, being a monadic type and the fact that you have a disjunction that, rep that represents you know, sort of a composable, um, it, well, it's a composable sum type. Now, since these are flat map operations, remember it, these, if the first one uh, fails as an error, you're, you're, you have an error, the entire value is, is gonna be the error value. Um, if it's a second one fails, the entire one's an error value as well. So it actually, it's, it, you think of it as a short circuited behavior. And once again, you look at the fact that these are flat map operations, that's actually quite clear because if you're doing a flat map, and you're trying to do a flat map on a value that, um, you know, that um, on an empty value or value on the left side, then then obviously that's going to be, it's not, you know, you're not going to have that computed. It's going to basically short circuit within the flat maps, a uh, series of flat maps. So that's, this will be an important, this is important uh, uh, distinction of, of or I should say distinction that this more this this is an important principle that you'll see that comes interesting later on. Now we can also do pattern matching on disjunctions. So you could say I want to match if it's left or right. So that works as you would expect. You could also wrap exceptions. Now, I will be honest with you. As soon as I learned this, I knew I stopped completely writing try-catch blocks. I don't use Scala util try as well. This is what I use. And we're actually on, on my team here uh, at AOL. We're, we're using Scala Z. Um, so th that's the flavor of this set that, you know, that I find myself using. And cats, you know, also a great library, which I highly recommend take a look at too. Um, that's the way you would do it in cats. Very similar. Once again, <clears throat> there's more differences as you dig deeper into the library, but I, I show some, both examples in all my code here for folks that, that want to, that are considering both libraries, maybe working in both. So, so you can wrap exceptions and what happens is it takes your, it, you, it may fail could be a function that throws an exception. And what it will do is it'll take that and convert it into a disjunction. Now this, once again, disjunctions being a monadic type, this encourages referential transparency. So it's one of the steps along the way to writing more pure code, code that's easier to reason about, easier to compose. So this it's highly recommended that this this is a great way to to handle exceptions. <clears throat> so now let's revisit our sum of means again. So we we be in two mean values yield a plus b. Now once again we're chaining flat maps together and applying a map at the end. Now this is actually a very it's a very generic approach. The flat map operation is a very powerful operation. But once again, there's a cost to that power. And the cost is that we're short circuiting if one of them has an, results in an error condition. Well, 
there's a concept that has it's 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 been communicated number of ways. Here's a few of them. I'm sure there's more that aren't listed here. Where in computer security, you want to not provide too much privilege to a user. Because if you do, if you provide too much pri privilege to a user, then you know they can make a mistake or maybe you know do something you shouldn't be doing, uh, uh, you know, in the software system, computer system, or some you know some sort of where we have a, a security uh, guidelines of some kind. And also, you have the rule of least power, suggesting that you want to use the least powerful language suitable for a given purpose. So this applies to FP as well where you want to try to find the tool that is just powerful enough to do what you want, but not too powerful. Because then you start depending on that in ways that you shouldn't. And what you want to do, so essentially using the tool that's exactly right for, for the job. And with FP, that, that, is, more, that is more possible than other, than other uh, alternative uh, approaches to writing software because you're using such fine-grained concepts. So if we want to take the mean of two values that are disjunctions and add them together, well, we can't use a functor because it's not powerful enough. A monad works, and we saw that with a, a particular implementation of monad known as a disjunction, but it's a bit too powerful. Well. We need something in between, in other words. Now, <clears throat> a functor is not powerful enough because, well, that's only for mapping one thing of a type to another, uh, to, to, the, to the same same thing of a different type. So what we need are applicative functors. So an applicative functor, what... What might, what would it look, what would something that, that would be an applicative functor look like that we, you know, that could actually solve this for us? Well, we need something that looks kind of like this method right here where we're saying we have some dual functor. Because one functor is not going to cut it. Well, let's have something that's kind of like two functors, sort of. It's more like, well, we have a mean one f int, mean two f int, and we want to have a function that passes in. Well, a function that you pass in that accepts and a two ints and gives a double. And as a result, you get an F double. So the way you would use that is you'd say, okay, you have some dual function. You say, okay, pass in mean X and Y. And pass in a function that takes A and B and adds them together. That's essentially what we want. Something that's actually, you could do something like this. And <clears throat> it's going to give you, it's going to handle all the cases. Uh, just just like we just like we did with um, with disjunctions, but not have that short circuiting behavior that the powerful flat map has. We want something that's less powerful than a monad, but is able to do exactly what we want here. Well, if you take the if you just look around in the Scala Z code base, you're going to find something like this right here called the apply trait. Now, it turns out this is actually kind of what we want. You see there's these different methods, app, app2, app3. Well, what's the first one? The first one's just like a functor, really. It's a degenerate case. So the degenerate case of the applicative functor is a functor. It's a single, you have an f of a, you have a function that goes at f type a to b, it gives you an f b. Well, app two says, okay, we have an F A and F B, and then we're gonna say F of you know the the tuple A B to Z, and then you get an F of Z. And you have app three, and we have to basically list all these out because an applicative functor is about taking taking <coughs> taking different um it's it's sort of like you can think of it like a multiplex functor where you're, you're, you're providing your parameters and it's actually giving you a, it's, it's mapping them all through to a, to a single result. So, so this, is, this actually looks like the kind of abstraction we need. Now in CATS, 
and scroll Z, we have applicative functor support. And the way this is done is it's using this interesting notation where you say you, you use the, the pipe at pipe. And that says, okay, we're going to combine these two means, okay? And in catch, you use the map method. You, 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 you say map, and you pass your function to it. And what that does is if both the values are defined, it's going to add them together. Now, if you have three, you could, you could do three as well. That's, that's the app three method, which I showed earlier. In scroll Z, it's very similar. The only difference is you don't call a dot map. It's just, it's a multiple argument. Uh, operation right there. So, <clears throat> so very similar. Scroll Z. Now this this operator has a number of names. It's been commonly called the Home Alone operator, the Tie Fighter operator, the Cinnabon operator. So you can call it whatever you want. So, right. So now that we're we're using applicative functions, there's no there's no flat mapping. There's no shared circuiting behavior. Well, we're gonna jump right to what I consider to be sort of killer app of applicative functors, and it kind of ties back to our original example. And those are validations or validated if you're using cats. <laughs> so. In addition to our mean function, let's add another one. Let's add a square root function. Okay, let's say that. Okay, if you're, if we're, let's say we only want to handle, uh, we don't want to handle imaginary numbers. Okay, so we'll say if it's less than zero, we're going to return this error. If it's a, uh, if it's not less than zero, then we can, uh, you know, return, um, you know, return in. Uh, well, it'd be this, the square root of n, actually. I don't know how that got left out, but anyway, the square root of n. Um, yeah, I was messing with these slides, so that would be the square root of n, okay? Um, so let's say we want to, uh, um, so we want to combine these two together, where we have a square root operation and a mean operation combined here. We say square root of negative one, and then the mean of nil. Well, look what's going to happen here. We're going to say we're going to we're going to find that what I mean. Remember, our original problem is that we have short circuiting behavior. So once there's an error, the uh, the the error the single error is returned by itself. Well, that same thing seems to happen here. Actually, we're only getting one error. We're not seeing an error that oh, okay, you didn't provide any values uh, to to the mean operation. It'd be nice if we would get, you know, all the errors combined, but we only have one error here. Well, the reason for this is applicative functors doesn't define how we deal with these multiple errors, okay? Because remember, an applicative functor is all about you're combining your values in, uh, you're combining the values to the computer result, all right? So in a case where you have, you have, you have these disjunctions, that actually do not, <clears throat> when you're using disjunctions in your applicative functors, <clears throat> excuse me, you, you, we want to have a way to combine the errors together if we, you know, we have one or more errors in your computation. Well, that's what validation and validator are for. <clears throat> Notice it's actually very similar to disjunction. We have a left and right, where left is the air condition, the right are is your final values, <clears throat> your final value. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Well, the difference here is we're, we're, we have another argument passed here, known as it's a semi-group of EE. Now, let's go back to what a semi-group was. Remember what a semi-group was? It support, it's like a, it's like a, a monoid. <clears throat> which once again, a monoid supports a pend and zero, but a semi-group doesn't have a zero, just a pend. Well, that's what we need here. We need some way of appending a list of errors together. That's why we have this implicit semi-group of EE passed in through here. And as you're using validations, um, 
you would have you would have the right implicit within scope to to handle that, which you know will show you examples. So we could you could use list to represent the list of errors. <laughs> However, what if the list is empty? So in other words, you have a you have a validation of either list of errors or your final value. Well, an empty list of errors, does that mean that there were no errors? Or does it mean that, yeah, there, there are errors, but we don't know what they were? Is it ambiguity there? You don't know what that means. Um, so that's why we have this type known as a non-empty list. And a non-empty list is a list, of, as its name suggests, that's guaranteed to have at least one element. So... <clears throat> You often have like a non-empty list of errors, either like a string or a throwable exception, or your final values result. So in cats, here's how we do this. You say <clears throat> you we have a mean, and if there's no value, if it's nil, we say, okay, no value provided. We do, you call this dot invalid NEL, which would be defined through through these uh you know, sort of, the, sort of these, uh, you would get this from imports. So you, you'd have to have, you know, some cats imports to get this. <clears throat> um, so you could say that, okay, this is an invalid NEL. Now, by the way, uh, NEL is non-empty list. So validated NEL, you could have just write that as validated non-empty list string comma double. But since it's very common, very commonly used, there's a special, there's a validated NEL type for you. So really, doing validations is kind of similar to disjunctions, in that you know the sort of the way you express them here. Scroll is very similar, just a lot of the names are a little different. Failure and success, or before for for cats, it's invalid, valid. Scalzi failure success, and they have the same NEL uh, validation NEL types as well. So very because similar between cats and Scalzi. <laughs> so now when we a pet we when we per, we want to do an operation where we combine mean and square root by adding them together, the errors are going to be appended together, and you'll see this one end type. This is a cats thing where you actually it, it it's it's a non-empty list is is expressed internally as you have this value and this value, this value, and so on. So that's that's how that's what that's all about. But you see right here, you have all the errors combined here because <clears throat> we have we have an implicit semi group that that's defined and passed into here that actually supports depend operation. So you have you're actually handling error conditions. All right, so now I'm going to do like a quick. I'm going to do an inter, a quick peek at shapeless. Sort of a, get, switch gears a bit. Now, those of you who haven't had a chance to take a look at shapeless yet, <clears throat> in in Miles' own words, he's 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 uh he's the one behind shapeless, um, or you know the one that started the project. You know, did you know most of the work on it. Um, he is has defined shapeless as it's a type class dependent type based generic programming library for Scala. And my way of describing it is it really it really pushes the boundaries of the rich of of Scala's rich type system, giving a way to define recursive structures. <laughs> now I'm just going to be giving sort of a quick preview of of shapeless. Just to give you some ideas uh, of, of, uh, of some really useful things you could do uh, with the library, and I'm going to show you a major part, the core piece of Shapeless are H lists or heterogeneous lists. Now, an H list is a product type. Now we talked about product types before, like case classes would be a big example of a product type. Um, here we're defining a an H list such that the first element's a string, the second is an int, and the third is a boolean. And of H nil at the end. Pretty interesting, right? Because you're actually in the type system, you're saying you're defining a list of types. 
and HNL terminates that list. <laughs> okay, I'm going to create an H list right here. I can say, okay, Picard 2305, true, HNEL, NIL. <laughs> and then there you go, we just created an H list. So, to do that as a case class, you'd have to create a case class, a certain name, and have all your fields in it. So one could argue that this would be more like kind of a more generic way of defining uh, products than case classes. <clears throat> now, H lists, they can be recursively defined. Their structure is, allows you to do pattern matching on them, or pattern matching on, on them. And what you can do is you can say, okay, I have an H list of type data or data H list, and you can match the head and the tail. And it's just like if you were on a using a regular list, it would work as you'd expect. They have the head, which is a single element, and the tail is the H list of the rest of the elements. Now this is where it gets interesting, and this is kind of where the you start to see the power of H list is that. They're, denied, they're designed to be very generic and can be converted between different types that, that have the same, you know, have the same structure to them. <clears throat> so say you have a grocery item, name and cost. Well, we could take that grocery item and say, okay, you go generic grocery item, you say two dot two, and you pass your grocery item in there, boom, you get a shape, you get a nice H list out of that that rep matches representation of the grocery item. So they're both product types, but an H list would be kind of this really flexible type that could be, uh, you know, man manipulated. <clears throat> and then we have, and then say we have like a grocery item, we got want to go from Res9, go from the from the H list, and guess what happens? We end up with the case class again. So you can imagine some really interesting uses there, where you're building a library <clears throat> where you want to handle collections of data, and be able to change their representation um, <clears throat> for, for different operations. So that, like I said, like I promised, this was a sort of a quick sort of introduction of sh uh, shapeless. There's a lot more provided there, like flattening tuples, converting between tuples, list H lists, um, <clears throat> transforming between generic types. Um, there's even, by the way, there's also uh, Shapeless also offers uh, its own form of a co-product or some type, but unlike the one that we looked at earlier in uh, in this talk, where we talked about disjunctions, the the co-product supported by by Shapeless supports n number of n number of values. So it could be this, uh, this, or this, or this, or this. So you have yeah, that encoding the type system. So shapeless supports that as well. And then generic processing of H lists of, you know, arbitrary size, you know, using you know, really, um, re, you know, really uh, impressive, uh, the recursive implicit uh, mechanism. So, so yeah, definitely recommend taking a look at shapeless more. So hopefully you just, you know, this gives you sort of, an, uh, you know, sort of, sort of motivation behind that. So, so yeah, this is pretty much the, this, so yeah, this is pretty much an introduction to a lot of really, um, just give you an idea of some of the ma uh, amazing things you could do at FP, looking at, you know, the Scholar Z and Cats libraries, which are, you know, once again, they are, they are a uh, sort of an implementation of, uh, or of category theory concepts. So it's a mapping from from a you know fairly abstract branch of mathematics into actually building reusable pieces of code that have well-defined laws and allow you to build co complex systems that you understand completely what's going on because each of these pieces <clears throat> you you know how to compose them, you know how each of the pieces uh, operate independently so it's all about writing pure elegant and reliable code so yeah it i guess uh, any any questions hey ryan, ryan can you hear me hello yeah cool, cool. so i'll just pass the mic around cool raise your hand <coughs> Yeah.
Yeah, at the beginning of the presentation, uh, you uh, had a listing of uh, different uh, features and traits that characterize a functional programming. And you had in big. Yeah. 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 Go back to the beginning here. Yep. Correct. And you put in uh, big letters, strictly speaking, I was wondering if that was a joke because uh, you don't mention laziness uh, on the list. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. So, so what do you think <laughs> about laziness uh, role in, in, in all this? So la laziness, boy, that's, that, that's a great question. Um, so <coughs> laziness really, I mean, if you're, if you're talking about in the Haskell sense, um, I haven't actually worked in Haskell, honestly, but I know that Haskell defines everything Everything is actually la lazily evaluated. Um, I think you could actually do some exceptions there, but whereas Scala is sort of inverted, where everything is is eagerly evaluated by default uh, versus lazy. But I think there's a broader concept of laziness, and um, and I I agree that would deserve its own bullet on this slide actually, and. To, to me, laziness, um, if you were to, like, say we were talking about, like, defining, defining, uh, like, you talk about Scala Z futures, um, and you define an operation, well, what happens when you define a future? It runs a future right immediately. Well, the alternative to future would be Scala Z concurrent task. And we actually use that a lot here, uh, my team here at AOL. And... That, that would actually be a lazy form of a future where you're actually defining an operation, but it doesn't actually execute until you run it. Well, why would you do something like that? Well, because, well, what if you want to take that task that's of type A, and you want to say, okay, we're going to flat map that with another task, so combine the tasks together, or maybe do a map operation where you convert A to a B, you want to do some manipulation on, on, these, on these pure concepts without actually running them, without actually running the, the Scala Z task. So that, that would be a form of laziness right there where, and I guess it's, it, it's actually, it's sort of implied, I suppose, by if you were to combine comp, comp, composability and referential transparency. Because what we want to do is we want to defer side effects. We want to defer affecting, affecting, uh, affecting behavior in your code towards the edge of the world of your code base and have as much of the core as pure as possible. So yes, I agree that um, I, so sort of circling back on this, maybe I wouldn't necessarily add a bullet on this slide, but I would say that that is a necessary emergent property of, of, of code that actually achieves all the items in this list. Does that answer your question? Yes, it did. Uh, who else has a question? Someone else has to have a question. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been using functional programming for a little while at our at our work right now, and uh, I think where we're trying to figure out with Scala is where the balance lies between kind of implicit code and functional programming. Um, we're using ACA quite a bit and mm -hmm. uh, and trying to fit, I guess, some functional and non-functional libraries together and trying to find some of the best, uh, you know, ways to, to do that. And I think that can become quite a stumbling block is to try and take something that's yeah. uh, declarative <laughs> and then to try and convert it back into something that's implicit and expecting exceptions and, and this and that. And I was wondering if you had any tips for that. Yeah, so um, actually, I remember when I was actually t attending a uh, a shapeless workshop that that, that uh, Miles Saban was hosting. He received a pretty much the same type of a question, and I'll sort of echo what what he said there, and, and add you know add add a bit more as well. Um, so 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 yeah, it's it's about trying to what you want to do is is the, the, the goal of FP is to try to implement as much of your code to be as pure 
and referentially transparent as possible. And refer referential transparency is, that is the core concept of, of FP, and that, that is the main goal. You could forget everything else and just say, okay, referential transparency is my goal. And everything else that we've talked about today sort of falls from that. Now, when you're talking about dealing with external services, code that is less pure, mutable, very stateful, um, it's, I, I do see a lot of people, teams, resort to, um, to using, you know, ver various frameworks, you know, like, like, like Aka actor systems. And to be honest, that's not the approach I would recommend, uh, in general as, as actor systems are stateful and side effect, uh, driven by their very nature. Um, I try not to get, I, I wanted to get into on this talk, but that that's, that's a whole other topic. That that requires that requires a lot more attention. But but I would say I would say just keep that in mind that that this goal of trying to write you know more more pure code that's easier to reason about is it 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 Aka can actually it can can make it more difficult to do that. Just the actor system in general. I mean, as an actor systems go, Aka's Aka Aka's you know it's an excellent actor system. But I'm talking about sort of the concept of actors generically. Um, so, so yeah, that's the real, the real, the real idea is once again, you're trying to factor out a lot of, a lot of the code that, that, that depends on these external services and make the, and not, not allow their design, the design of these external pieces influence design of your code. You want to try to push out to, to the edge of your code base as much as possible. That's really what it what it all comes down to. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Anybody else? Can Can you mention maybe at the high level or with a, a reference, possibly uh, of some concrete examples where um, the each list uh, power that you suggested uh, uh, shows for some concrete problems that you might solve? Uh, li list uh, list of power. You mean? Well, your example was abstract. So, how do we use that in, in a project or in real life? Are you talking about in, in uh, oh, what I was just explaining about trying to push us effects to the edge of your code base? Is that what you mean? I'm talking about H list. Oh, H list. I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't hear the H list part. Okay. Um. So. <sighs> HLIS, the places where I've seen HLIS used the most is when you're trying to, it's when you're, generally when you're writing a library for other people to use. I haven't seen it come up as often as for, for actually writing, um, <clears throat> for actually writing, uh, I guess, application level code or, or more, uh, um, or, or just regular backend services, more like libraries that you know that are used by by services and applications. So that's where I see HList comes up more. And the reason we're behind that is because I mean HList, it's about normalizing data, and you'll see a lot of uh, you, you'll see folks that when they use HList, they'll use it as like, okay, I want HList to represent my data. In normalized form, but I may convert it to a case class here. I may convert it to this here. I may, you know, serialize it out, you know, to to some other format. And H lists are are really good, sort of, uh, sort of like a normal format that you can use for doing that. That's the place where I've seen uh, H lists used the most. Um, I would take take a look at the, you know, you could if, if you take a look. At the uh, the GitHub project, you know, he, he explain uh, Miles Sabins explains, you know, in in more detail of, you know, different applications, um, or just kind of gives examples that I think that I think would would, you know, make it more clear what, what I'm saying there. Um, 
I, I added H, H list here because I think that there's, there's not too many places where you find like a really sort of quick introduction to give you an idea. Oh, okay. I see, I see what you can do with H list. Um, but it's a really kind of an in-depth uh, topic that really would, would merit a, a whole new talk uh, onto itself. <clears throat> Okay. So, um, just with your experience at uh, at Verizon and AOL, when you kind of go down the more pure functional rabbit hole, did you ever have any kind of issue with hiring? Um. So, I feel like there's actually a second qu question in there where you refer to a pure functional rabbit hole. Um, it's funny. I was just having an interesting conversation about that today with some folks. I'm and biased, so sorry. Sorry. I said I'm left biased. <laughs> oh no problem. Yeah, maybe just yeah. It's like just a devil's advocate question where. You oh, know, that's fine. As you get as you get more into some of the more advanced um, functional libraries, obviously there's less talent that can work with them. So how do you? Oh, it's true. This so yeah. It's. Um, so, so first, first I'd like to first I'll I'll, I'll address the rabbit holeness of FP there, real just real briefly. I'm I'm sure we're, I, I might I might be sort of preaching the choir here, but um, when when I when I think of like when I first saw Scala Z, um, which is actually I, I before working at you know Verizon, I was working at Netflix, and uh, that was actually where I was uh, introduced. One, one of the guys on the team actually introduced me to Scala Z, and the first time I saw it, I thought, "Oh boy, this is a rabbit hole." That was what I thought initially, and I noticed a very surprising thing as I worked with it more and learned more about it, is that you know what? It's actually an inverse rabbit hole. When you dig deeper with Scala Z or Cats, you actually you're not digging deeper in a rabbit hole, but you're realizing, hey, I'm already in a rabbit hole. I'm digging my way out. And that's not that's not an exaggeration because what it's doing is it forces you to think of what are you doing? I mean, no, not what you not what you think you're doing. What are you really doing? What are you trying to do here? And you start factoring your problem out in in really, really deeply meaningful ways. And I think I think it's really key to to understand that because I've never found a time where it's like oh no I'm wasting time with Scala I'm trying to dig through here and there because every time I dig deeper I I gain it you you start to understand more more things become clear yeah you get you can get really confused sometimes but but that's just because you know it's just part of the learning process and you know you have to kind of look at tutorials and that sort of ties in your you know the main part of your question of how do you deal with you know onboarding training new people and this is I mean this this is a fairly new um, sort of an uncharted realm in in in, uh, in the industry because I mean FP has existed in academia for a long time and has recently sort of had a resurgence and people are wanting to make use of it you have some companies that are sort of backing off a little bit because maybe they started Scala work in Scala for the wrong reasons. Just kind of like, oh, you know, make this code nice and concise and more pretty, but not realizing, hey, there's some deeper concepts you have to really dig into to get the full benefit. And I think that's the key when you're onboarding people and and understanding that, you know, you're you're essentially teaching people a completely new way of looking at writing software. And it's it it is it's a bit challenging. It requires having sort of like a sort of, you know, having having a culture of learning uh, on your team. And that, that's what we have. We have workshops. We have a book club where we actually go through R Runar Bjarnason and Piel, Paul Chiasano's uh, uh, functional programming in Scala, you know, often referred to as a red book. Yeah, we um, have the, um we we have a book club on that on that book in Toronto here too. So excellent. We're preaching to the choir. It's uh, yeah, yeah. It's more of a kind of like lessons learned. If um if there's anything you had to do to to yeah. really less sort of like I don't want to say I don't want to say like hide <laughs> some some of the yeah. onboarding, but at least contain it. Yeah, it's it's uh you. <clears throat> 
the thing I've noticed is that you'll see some people kind of you have to really make the time for learning and having these workshops and just encouraging people to go to them. And it really helps to have management buy-in to the sort of make this, make this a thing that, that, that is becomes a regular part of people, uh, part of the week for people. The thing that I find that impedes uh, <clears throat> learning and advancing in this is not really that people aren't curious. I mean, I find that people are generally like, wow, this is really cool. They, they are curious. They, they, they see that there's, there's something here, something really deep knowledge here that they want to tap more into. But what happens is like, oh, you know, crap, I got, I got this, uh, these tickets to work on and sprints about the close. And it's, it, they sort of get this, you know, this itch that happens like, oh man, I'm not writing code. I, I got it. I got a ticket coming up. And so it, it's a matter of, you know, being able to pull away from that and say, okay, no, I'm going to learn this. Cause I know this is going to, this is going to allow me to write better code, you know, going forward. So it's, we're talking about, it, it's largely a matter of discipline and sort of setting aside, you know, what, the way, you know, sort of past ideas of how software should be constructed. Um, I, I want to add one note, by the way, I for, forgot to mention, uh, I'm actually going to be presenting at Scala by the Bay. Um, my, my talk is actually, if you ch check the schedule, my, you know, uh, check schedule, it's a, um, I'll, be, I'll be presenting, my talk is actually entitled uh, The False Economy of OOP. Um, object-oriented programming. So, so anyway, it's good. It's probably good. It's good to touch on to what 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 I'm talking about right now here too. So, thanks, Mike. Yep. Anyone else? All right. Let's give uh, Ryan a round of applause. All right. All right, so so thanks a lot for uh, for joining us, Ryan. I know it's, you're on Pacific time, so you you took a, an hour out of your workday. So thank you very much. No problem. Thanks a lot.